While that's uh, firing up, I'd like to thank the uh, Ahmadiyya Muslim Student Group for inviting me as an example at least, and maybe even a representative of the 24% of Canadians who are atheists. That's about eight and a half million people in round numbers, by the way. Uh, second largest philosophical group in the country. Uh, so, thank you. Um, before I go any further, I really feel always compelled to spend a little time clarifying terms, agnostic, atheist, and humanist, because wherever I go, people <coughs> seem to have some unusual ideas. Not the least of whom is Richard Dawkins, who really doesn't understand agnostic, the agnostic philosophy at all. Um, so, we agnostics, and the term was coined by Thomas Huxley in 1869 to describe the problem that you cannot uh, decide things metaphysically without empirical evidence, and so therefore we cannot know certain things. So there are really only three things you need to know about us agnostics. One is that we require empirical evidence, scientific or historical, to consider something to be true. We are comfortable not knowing things that are unknowable, so we won't backfill with suppositions and so on. And agnostics are curious, and we consider imagination to be a path to hypothesis or the beginning of discovery. I've only met two kinds of atheists in my life. The first kind is a traditional atheist, a la Richard Dawkins and company, who say there is no God. They're not very happy with me as an agnostic because I immediately say to them, where's your evidence? <laughs> On the other hand, most Canadians are actually postmodern atheists, and they apparently say, they say, I don't believe in God. And apparently don't believe in putting quotation marks on both sides of their quotations. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyhow, <laughs> mea culpa. I also would like to spend a minute talking about secular humanism. Um, again, it's a eupraxophy that describes how atheists, whether they belong to humanist organizations or not, uh, make ethical decisions based on the knowledge of the world around them. And I am a member of the, that particular philosophy. Now, I, I really need to talk about empirical evidence for a minute because, again, so many people are confused about that. We're all pretty much familiar, because secular humanists flog this all the time, about the idea of scientific empirical evidence. To do that, you need a hypothesis, you need to do some kind of experimentation or modeling and verification. That's what the Stephen Hawking's of the world do. They come up with mathematical equations, and then somebody else comes out and finds out that the Higgs boson really does exist, so they don't have to go back to square one. Uh, at any rate, we need to go back. Thank you. Um, these things have to be repeated. They're subject to peer review, and they're subject to peer review forever. So we're now looking at the Big Bang Theory and realize that it may have been actually a more pulsation. That doesn't destroy the Big Bang theater, just Theory, it just adds to our knowledge. Um, now, I need, I need to talk about historical, don't, don't get in a hurry. You're such an eager young man, I, it's just amazing. My reflexes are not as good as yours, obviously. Okay, historical empirical evidence. Now my background happens to be history, and one of the things that is greatly neglected, in my opinion, in talking about empirical evidence is historical empirical evidence. And there are two things you have to have to have reasonable historical empirical evidence. The first thing is a primary source. That primary source should be somebody who's a qualified observer who wrote things down immediately after the event and who was there. Then, in addition to that, this is not an either or, this is a, you have to have both, then you need a secondary source or secondary evidence. That needs to be third party, objective, doesn't belong to the same political party or the same religious movement or whatever. Also at the time of the event, okay? So those are the things that I look for when I'm looking for empirical evidence in order to decide whether something really is true or not. Okay, now you go. All right, so. Empirical evidence for God or gods? Well, first of all, no one's ever been able to even set up an empirically acceptable test or model or observation that will generate any proof 
of the existence of any gods. If anyone here in the audience has done that, please let me know. Um, it, it, you're really, you're going to be very wealthy. Um, now, what about historical evidence? Well, in all the religious readings I've read, and it's not a lot of them, I was raised in the Christian church, so I'm familiar with the Gospels primarily. I'm working my way through the Quran. Be patient, I'll get there. Um, the primary sources are kind of suspect because the Gospels weren't written down until 80 or 100 years after the supposed events. So there goes your, some of the requirements for, our, for the pri that primary evidence that I asked for. In addition to that, it seems that the book of Mark, the Gospel according to Mark, was actually written by several people. What about secondary sources? Well, they're rare in terms of Gospel and often don't support the primary story. If you know anything about the Roman occupation of Jerusalem, you know that if anybody walked into Jerusalem with people waving palm fronds and throwing them down in front of them and yelling, Yigri, Hosanna in the highest, in multitudes apparently, the Romans would have known about it because they had spies everywhere. And they didn't tolerate that kind of stuff. And they probably wouldn't have had to pay anyone 30 pieces of silver to betray them. So sometimes the secondary evidence doesn't actually support so you can understand why I'm at least skeptical about the Gospels. Okay, go ahead. So, next thing we have, of course, is logical arguments, because that's where we like to be. My experience with theologians is that they confuse logical validity with logical truth, and that's a common error. I've got a very simple little argument there. I've kept it simple because I wanted to fit it on the slide and I didn't want to confuse myself, but, this is a simple syllogistic argument, this deductive reasoning. A equals B, C equals B, therefore C equals A. Okay, logical. That's a valid argument, no question about it. The conclusion follows directly from the premise and from the condition, and away you go. It's logically valid. But it can only be true if the premise is true. True A has to equal B, or this is not a true, it's not true. You're not getting to truth. You're getting to some kind of conclusion that's not true. It's also only true if B and C, or sorry, if C, yeah, actually equals B. And that's where the problem lies, that we get arguments that are circular and you cannot, and the deductive argument premise must be something that's already known, otherwise you can't use it. So the ontological argument, reduced to texting format, comes down to God is perfect. If God didn't exist, he wouldn't be perfect. Therefore, God exists. Well, the problem is that you haven't proven that God is, and you haven't proven that God is perfect before you go on with the rest of your syllogism. Okay, since we secular humanist atheists aren't prepared to accept the empirical evidence for God, what are they? You can go ahead and there. What are gods? Well, I'm going to draw my literary background and tell you that, as far as I can tell, they're the world's longest extended metaphor. Uh, we atheists think of gods as the product of man's psychology and imagination. God is the world's longest extended metaphor for all the unexplained occurrences that have confronted human beings over millennia. That metaphor is extended to include God the Creator. God the controller of seasons, God the leader, God the judge, and God the scapegoat. All of these modes are at the behest of human beings who have created him or her or it. In all of these forms, we see the direct reflection of the needs, culture, and knowledge of the society that created them and worshiped them. God the creator has many forms, but I'll use the one in the Bible. In Genesis, and actually you can go on beyond that one, thank you. And I must apologize for this slide, it's a bit shaky, I think it's still vibrating from the Big Bang. Uh, <laughs> um, I'll use the one in Genesis. In Genesis, God creates the heavens and earth in six days and then rests on the seventh. Well, why would an omnipotent being need to rest? That seems to be a very human characteristic, especially since Apparently, the creation of the universe seems to take relatively minimal effort. I mean, he said, let there be light, and there was light. And then 
Wouldn't that be more effort if he'd had to at least rub two cosmic sticks together to get light? You see, this is a human in a human form because the people who wrote that knew how hard it was to start a fire, which is the only way they had light. They knew how difficult it was to build things. And so they, as good storytellers, couched it in terms that their listeners would understand. God, the controller of seasons, that's the next one, or Mother Nature, uh, explained in the absence of Environment Canada, you know, those folks that predicted, that gave you 20 centimeters of partly cloudy to shove off your drive, that, those folks. Why the frost came earlier than expected or why there was a drought. Even sophisticated Greeks attributed, attributed lightning to Zeus and storms to Poseidon, an angry Poseidon rather. My ancestors, who the Greeks called Celtic, the outsiders, had druid priests who constructed serious mechanisms to determine the exact day of winter solstice to give farmers a better chance in northern Europe, northern Europe shorter climates. But attribute disruptions in the seasons to a subterranean dragon that must be appeased. God, the leader, is a constant in all the gods invented. Two more. Keep going. There we go. All right. Um, but, but I'm going to stick with the Judeo-Christian Muslim God. And to do that, we must go back to his discovery as an obscure Egyptian God called Yahweh. Um, but don't tell anyone. Shh. We don't want anyone to know his origin. Okay. Now, he was exactly the kind of God. You can go on to that. that stay there. Thank you. He was exactly the kind of God that rebelling Hebrew slaves needed to convince the Egyptians to let them go. But this war god, who was apparently all-knowing and all-powerful, needed his followers to smear lamb's blood on their doorways so he'd not kill their children. Now, were his angels of death really super beings, or were they just terrorists who didn't want to make a mistake? Question unanswered. Nevertheless, his war leader qualities still come to the fore often enough. In both of the wars of the 20th century, German soldiers wear belt buckles embossed with Gott mit uns, God is with us. And every Allied regiment had a coterie of chaplains just to make sure they understood that their God was with them. And meanwhile, the Japanese warlords were making sure the Shinto gods were on their side. Now, next one, please. God the judge is an important one, even for us atheists. The rules that were given to Moses by the Bible's authors, tribal though they were, are still quoted, after suitable interpretation, by any of the 33,000 Christian sects as rules for behavior. Naturally, we atheists are, cons are assumed to be evil sinners by default because we don't accept these as being rules from any God. This assumption has nothing to do with us, really. We humanists make up far less than 24% of Canada's prison population, I can assure you. Theist tends to, def to define goodness as ob obeying those Ten Commandments or some other set of rules, even though they don't cover such problems as slavery and racism. They are, after all, and in fact, to be fair, Epicurus' 40 principal doctrines don't cover that either. After all, these are thoughts made up by men, yes, men of their time. So one thing, however, sept separates God the judge from other metaphoric existences. He needs the help from the devil, another human creation who lives like the druid dragon beneath the earth's surface and keeps these hellfires going for eternity, or at least until the Maple Leafs win the Stanley Cup. <laughs> Now, God the scapegoat is the worst of the metaphoric projections. Whenever there is a disaster, large or small, some theist is likely to use the magic phrases, it's God's will, or he works in mysterious ways to salve the, ang the victim's angst. The tsunami that ripped into the Philippines a few years ago showed some theists, theists their God's wrath because not enough people were going to mosque regularly. 
The injury to a little girl in a farm machinery just outside of Elmira was a part of God's will and plan rather than her father's inattention. At least that's what he told reporters. So God, the metaphor, is omnipresent by virtue of the ubiquitous imaginations of human beings, all trying to cope with the harshness of a universe into which we've evolved and in which we have little significance. How does this affect us atheists? Well, the International Humanist and Ethical Union, along with the United Nations, published a Freedom of Thought report at the end of 2013. That report categorizes all 194 sovereign nations on the planet into five categories based on their legal treatment of atheists. Fewer than 8% treat atheists fairly and equally, as free and equal. But 17% commit grave violations against atheist human rights. Tragically, 13 of that last category execute atheists just for not believing in God. Well, these worst offenders are all theocracies, countries where separation of church and state has disappeared. While church, groups like Secular Connectional Secular regularly advocate for the elimination of systemic discrimination against atheists in Canada, their main focus is to insist that Canada's Office of Religious Freedom stop merely mouthing support for atheist rights and actually speak out against the abuses of these theocracies to persecute atheists, and particularly against those 13 theocracies that execute us. Gods are definitely a fiction in our perspective, but human rights abuses committed against atheists in the name of these fictions are fact. Thank you. <laughs>